I'm trying to get to the point where I have minimal editing and I want to take my time with my speaking so that I have less filler words because if anything, that's the only thing I want to edit is that, you know. So here we are and I just put pressure on myself to not use filler words tonight. So Ooh. let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. I'm ready. So uh, I want to talk about something. Let's talk about it. It's real. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't know. Like, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. And there's a part of me that knows that I see you kind of leading us into the conversation just because you seem to have a smoother delivery when it comes to just just bringing up the topic in a way that's just it's not as abrasive as I might want to get into it um and I also feel that the stuff that I want to share that was going to help people is very helpful people just are on the tip that's just like Where's that in the Bible? Yes. You know what I'm saying? And yes. I got I got the Bible for you. But I just think that sometimes that attitude is kind of, it's not offensive. Not that. It is, but when you're trying to bless someone and, and help someone, it's probably not the right attitude because the truth is, is that everything that I'll ever share here is biblical. Uh, and it's likely that if you don't know where this is in the Bible, maybe you just don't yet have the revelation. Maybe you don't know your Bible well enough or as well. And so maybe just, just allow me to share and let me to show you where in the Bible this is, you know, but don't be so quick to just be like, that ain't biblical. That ain't in the Bible. Maybe, like I said, maybe we're just not so aware of how much we really know what's in the Bible. And so I think that it's something that I have to take my time with. It's something that I don't know how many episodes this could really take if you really think about it. Like there's so many components to breaking this down. And there is a lot of scriptural basis for the stuff that I like to really share and get into. But I just, just feel like it's something that we just should take our time with. And just kind of see where it goes and see how long it takes and whether it's just us just talking until we run out of stuff to talk about and then we cut it up or we just say, let's just talk about this tonight. And so I just kind of want to just kind of let you maybe ask you a question to kind of intro the the topic and just kind of see where it goes. Okay. And so we're just trying to flow organic here and just... Just be conversational so it can be organic. This is not practice. We don't have script. I have life. I, I, yeah, this is our real life stuff. I, I think that's where I want to start. Um, okay. We had a conversation about, and maybe if you like to chime in, you felt that there's a difference between people that just put out information and then wisdom. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of information out there. Like that's actually the problem. Like everybody has information. There's too much information or or revelation and it's too loud and it's just too much stuff out there. We're just, we're libraries of stuff and it doesn't really mean anything. And so I find that when we can take that, that information and we find how this actually applies to our lives and then we can come here and make ourselves vulnerable and share life application stuff or testimony about how this information has become wisdom because it's been applied. That stuff is helpful, but you just have to be able to make yourself vulnerable to the people listening so that it can be more than just information. And I think that that's what could make what we're doing different is making sure that I'm not just sharing the revelation the Lord showed me in my prayer closet, but I'm actually realizing that that stuff that he's showing me in my closet is when we say, give us this day our daily bread. It's the daily bread. It's it's the stuff that I'm supposed to 
receive for today. And then I'm going to find how this is going to be applied today because I'm paying attention. I'm present. And when that happens, that information becomes wisdom. And I can share that with you. But some of that stuff is vulnerable. And so I believe that this is going to require us to go to a vulnerable space to say, like, look, this is real stuff. This is biblical. But I'll, let me show you how this is actually applied to our lives. So how would. And I haven't even. You haven't introduced. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what are we talking about yeah, today? Yeah, <laughs> like I'm kind of teasing you. You know right. what I'm saying? Um, I'm very jump in. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, come on, man. All right, on. so let me, let me, you go ahead and take it then. No, what? no, no, no. Huh? I mean, we, we're already, we're already. We building we've it. We've been wallowing in the, <laughs> yeah. in the shadow. So, okay, so let's just put it out there. Um, children and deliverance. That's one way to put it out there. Children and demons, children and how they manifest differently than we do, children and how what they're going through is related to what you're dealing with. There's a lot of ways we can put it out there. Right. Um, but bottom line is people come to us asking if we could see their children. And so we have an approach or we, we believe that there's a better way than just kind of just assuming your kid is the one with the problem. And so what do you say? I would like to say that I believe, strongly believe that deliverance in children is the parent's responsibility because this is not going to be a one-time thing, possibly not even a two-time thing. This is going to be an ongoing thing with children. Um, we've what do you mean? Um, like with children, like because it's ongoing for, for everybody. Because, yes, because it is ongoing for us. Right. And what we allow into our homes is going to affect and influence our children. We need to learn how, what deliverance is, how to... how to apply it in ourselves, how, how to do spiritual warfare in, our, in ourselves and over our children in our homes. We need to learn how to do that, but we can't learn how to do that if we ourselves have never received deliverance. If we have never ourselves experienced, experienced it and don't know how it applies, don't know what a stronghold is, don't know even how what to do with discernment. I see a lot of people who are like... Um, who have said, like, I see it in my children. I, I, I see, you know, uh, something that's not, that's beyond character, that's beyond morals. That's, I could tell there's a spiritual entity there influencing my children, but then I don't know what to do about it. So they reach out to someone who does, and that's great and all, but it's for you to practice, you to learn, you to learn how to apply it. So when you do discern that over your children, when you see this isn't something that could be cured, this isn't something that could be handled. This is a spiritual matter that I need to I need to handle right now or immediately you know what to do. And you know how to do it confidently. Because I've heard other people saying, is it going to work? You know, if I tell the spirit to leave, is it going is it going to leave? And that's just the lack of understanding and knowledge in a parent. Yeah, I think you you jumped in real hard. I did. I, I, I didn't want you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you. I, I'm trying to play good cop, bad cop here, and I needed you to slide in. Um, Why? Because, Why? Because, no, because this we're is, way ahead. You're way ahead of the such, ball right here. It is such a crucial matter. Yeah, I need you to back up it a little bit, It is such a crucial right, matter. Right, but you're way ahead. All right, all right. You might be all an right. hour ahead. All right, let's reel it back, back in. Up. Okay. And, and we need to talk about just... Why can't you just see my kid and fix him? Just, But I'm saying don't be me and just be like, it's because you the problem and you got the demons and you did it. Like, what is what is the take on? Um, our take, it's, yeah, it's, what's it's the take? simple. It's simple. We believe it's our children. We put the focus on our children, on their problems, their issues, um, you know, their rebellion, their disobedience, 
everything. We, we, we put focus on our children mm. and it's not. Our children are a reflection of us. In, what do you mean? In every way. What do you mean? If you parent with anger, anger is going to show up in your children's. It's going to manifest in your children. If you parent with fear, it's going to it's going to present itself in your children. And I know we'll get into this. It's not going to be the same way as you. Well, we're not talking about my parenting. We're just talking about little Johnny is bad. He's wilding and he's doing poorly in school and and he is fighting and he is doing X, Y, Z. And I just need him to get these demons out of him. Like, what does that have to do with me? I go to church. I am, you know, I have, I support my family. I do what I do. I, you know, I, I, I supply, you know, for my kids and I do everything I'm supposed to do. What that have to do with me? Can you help my child? Like, what do you mean I'm parenting with anger? What do you mean I'm parenting with fear? I just need you to fix this behavioral issue. I believe it's demonic. What does that have to do with me? It's a reflection of you. It's a reflection of what you are partnering with and you are allowing. And what you allow into your home is going to have influence over your kids. So I guess we're saying that oftentimes people don't realize that the issues they see in their children mm -hmm. are actually things that they themselves are internally dealing with and their children are exposing and manifesting them things in public and it's essentially telling on what's going on in the home. But because we tend to cope or mask or or sweep under the rug, whatever our issues are, we don't tend to, to see the issue that little Johnny has as our issue. And we don't tend to take responsibility for little Johnny's issues. We just see them as his own issue. Bad behavior. We see it as bad behavior. We see it as some influence from whether it be TV or, or kids at school or the bad crowd thing. And we just don't take responsibility. As parents, we think our job is to supply food and clothing and shelter and I guess a hug or love and you know when it's needed. But that tends to be where it stops when it comes to our responsibility as a parent. And so I believe that my wife is very gently saying, or I wanted you to be gentle because <laughs> she's not being very gentle right now. She, she, she's saying that, look, there's a spiritual responsibility that you have as a parent. And if you come with that attitude and you're saying they're the problem, then clearly you don't understand your responsibility spiritually as a parent. And that's where we essentially need to begin is understanding your responsibility spiritually and understanding just the whole the whole situation about just your spiritual jurisdiction over the child. And I think that if we had to teach a class or if we had to help that parent, it would be to one, insist that they themselves receive deliverance. And then within that session, we teach them about their spiritual jurisdiction and responsibility as a parent. Okay, can we go beyond um, the ministry that we provide? Like, how can a parent who doesn't have access to this deliverance ministry, like, can we teach them now? What, what would we teach a parent that came to a session? I think that... I don't think that there's a way around saying like, look, you, you need this and you should get it and you need to find it. They might not have access to us, but absolutely no, don't, I'm not going to say you don't need to get it. And this is a way to jump over that. You need deliverance. And until you get that, there are just things that your eyes will not be open to. 
And so you need that. That that definitely should be first step. What I think that we can do here is open your eyes to know that your children are, are absolutely manifesting something that is in you and kind of give you some examples, maybe with just allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and us sharing our testimony about how we've noticed some of these, th some of these things. And I absolutely have a biblical backup to sh show you that these are spiritual principles that are real and that that are absolutely effective if you employ these principles or, or these um, these strategies. And so I think that you just understanding that number one, your spiritual jurisdiction and responsibility is your is you. It's on you. Essentially it's it's your not your fault, but it's your responsibility. And until you take that as your responsibility and there is nothing else but your responsibility, you will not be able to be successful in helping that situation. I don't know if I'm ready for an example yet. Uh, what, what do you have to say there? I think changed already. I'm not worried about that. Oh, I'm not thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was saying I, 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 I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm ready for an example as far as how to apply that because you know I might need to give a little biblical. Um, so I was just wondering what, what you had, what you would add to that. So we're talking about we're talking about your responsibility as a parent and understanding that it is your responsibility and you do have skin in the game regarding your child's behavior. And as long as you're neglecting that, you are gonna miss out on an opportunity. I think that well, do you have your phone or do you have your Bible? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'm going to give you scripture. Okay. Um, Exodus twelve twenty two. See if you can read AMP. Twelve twenty two. Yeah. You shall take a bunch of hyssop. Is that how you say it? Try to. Is that how you say it? Hyssop? Hyssop? Okay. You shall take a bunch of hyssop. <laughs> you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and touch some of the blood to the lintel above the doorway and to the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. So this is this is when this is at the final plague in the in Egypt and Moses and Aaron are speaking to the fathers and it's just a picture of holy spirit the father or the priest of the home and he takes this information he goes back to the home and so I wrote down I said it was the father's job to cover his household in the blood of the lamb he had not only to kill the animal, but then drain the blood in a, into a basin. The blood while in the basin still does not protect you. It must be applied to the doorpost. The spiritual covering and protection of the child is ultimately the responsibility of the parent. And so if the father had not smeared the blood across the doorpost, he might have took all the other steps. But if he had not taken that one final step, he would have lost his firstborn child. But this is, this is just one example of how it is parental responsibility to spiritually cover or be responsible for 
the spiritual health of your child. Like I said before, we think it's our job only to provide food and shelter. When if the fathers had been delinquent that night, then all the firstborn would have died. So what would you say to someone who says spirituality isn't just boxed in that? Like I take my children to church, I read, I pray, you know, um, like I do handle the spiritual aspect of our life in those ways. Like why, why would you label this as spiritual and everything else is not? Well, first, I, I don't know that I would say anything is not. Everything is spiritual. Mm -hmm. I think that that is one area that you clearly aren't maintaining if, if you're at this point. Like if you're seeking help for your child and you don't know what to do. Like clearly this is an aspect that you haven't entertained. And so me sharing this to say like, look, you have a responsibility for the spiritual health and you have a responsibility to cover your child. And I'm specifically speaking to fathers. Right. Like it's, it's the father's responsibility. And if the fathers were delinquent that night, then there would have been a lot of weeping on the side of the Israelites as well. That, ain't, that death angel wasn't just looking for who was Hebrew and who was not. He was looking for blood. And so delinquent fathers is really the issue with a lot of our issues with right. our young people even today. Right. And so that is something that we have to take responsible for. And then I look at the story of Job and just the whole cosmology behind that. If you look at Satan approaching the father, the father, to even be able to touch his son Job. Like he had to go through the father to be able to come into that house. He was like, yo, you got all these barriers and you got all this protection over this guy. Like, like, let me get at him. And so that's another example, biblically, to show like, you got to go through the father to be able to touch anyone in that house of his child. And so once again, we see the father's covering and protection and everything has to go through him to access his house. And so... I feel like I don't have to get too deep and I can give you an example, me as a father, if there is something that I see my child struggling with, I immediately, and this is me, and this is me from the revelation I received through this biblical study, I understand that it is my responsibility and it's very likely that it's something that is that has come through me to be able to access my child in the first place. So if, if it's come through me to access them, that means it's something that I need to deal with in me. Because as long as I am dealing with that thing or that entity, my child will deal with it because I've allowed access into my house, into my bloodline, into my, my dominion. And so as long as I allow that, then it has free reign in my child because I, as the priest of my home, I'm the end all be all spiritually when it comes to what has access to my children. If I let it have access to me, it automatically has a permit into my bloodline. Can I ask you, how does that affect me as the mother? Do you also allow or have influence over the? Yes, over absolutely. And would you like me to share biblical yes. evidence uh, regarding Let's do that? that. Um, Let's go to Numbers chapter 30. Mm -hmm. Man, this is, this whole chapter is backing me up big time. This whole chapter is meat on that topic. It's only 16 verses, um, but I kind of, I know it. So I'm going to kind of just go over the highlighted stuff. Check this out. And this, this specifically, as you're answering your question, this is specifically talking about me as a father and my spiritual dis jurisdiction over my children, specifically my daughter and my wife. 
So this is this is real deep stuff. This is found in Numbers chapter 30. And it's only 16 verses in this. And I'm, I'm going to just cover a couple of them that pretty obvious here. I'll start with verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or, or swears an oath to bind himself with a pledge of abstinence, he shall not break or violate or profane his word. He shall do according to all the things that proceed out of his mouth. Also, if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by a pledge of abstinence while living in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and her pledge by which she has bound herself, and he offers no objection, then all her vows shall stand, and every pledge by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father disapproves of her making her vow on the day that he hears about it, none of her vows or pledges by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will forgive her because her father has disapproved of her making a vow. But if she marries while under her, while under her vows, or if she has bound herself by a rash statement, and her husband hears of it and says nothing about it on the day he hears it, then her vow shall stand and her pledge by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband disapproves of her making her vow or pledge on the day that he hears of it, then he shall annul her vow which she is under and the rash statement of her lips by which she bound herself and the Lord will forgive her. But the vow of a widow, well, let's just stop right there. Mm -hmm. I think I've said enough. Right. Like this is the Lord saying that if, if the top dog, has a beef with you making a vow or you coming into covenant or you coming into agreement with something, all he got to do is say, nah. And the Lord just, he, he's with dad. That's basically what that's saying. That's very interesting because in our deliverance ministry, when we do have a wife who wants to come in, what do we usually suggest to them? We typically suggest that the, the husband comes first because we understand this principle. We understand that this is how it works. The Lord actually honors the man as the priest of the home. This is how it's set up. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that oftentimes we have men at home that are not believers and the woman is like the, the Bible person, the Bible thumper, the Christian, the religious one, where the, the father might have nothing to do with it. But... He is still the priest of the home. Right. He is still the authority, the spiritual authority of the home. That's how it is in the spirit. And so this is speaking to the youth that live under the household and is speaking to the wife that is under the husband. If, if they come into agreement or if they're in covenant or if they, this is basically speaking to when we come in agreement and we come into covenant with things that are, this is a spiritual thing. And so we can come into agreement and covenant with spirits, with evil spirits, with curses. And so it's the husband's responsibility to say, nah, it's the husband's responsibility to, to annul that thing. Even if you decide you want to come into responsibility with it, I have the jurisdiction to say, nah. But oftentimes the father doesn't do that. Right. And the thing is, is that it says that if the father doesn't say anything after he hears it, then it's, it's considered okay. It's acceptable. Right. And so if the father sees a behavior and he sees something and he doesn't put his foot down, it's considered acceptable and that spirit or that that contract or that covenant or that curse, it now has a permit. It has a legally binding permit to function in the house, in the bloodline. When I say house, I mean bloodline. I mean, I am the priest of my bloodline. And so it is my jurisdiction to have a say with anything that comes into my household. So if I see my child misbehaving, I have a say in that. If I see a spiritual thing working within my child, or if I see some kind of curse manifesting through my children, I have a say. And if I don't say anything, I'm being a delinquent father. How can you tell about, by what is spiritual versus what could be, you know, 
a child with just bad character or, or bad habits. Or... That's spiritual. That is spiritual. What isn't spiritual, I think that's that's the key, is we have a fear of being overly spiritual. And I think that when we have fear of being overly spiritual, we typically miss the things that are indeed spiritual. And they 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 find a loophole and they pass through. I think that the key is is to just jump to an example and make ourselves vulnerable and just say like, here, this is how it typically works. I find that it works, how should I say this? I believe that it works most obviously in the firstborn. I think many of you know that the difference between the firstborn and the youngest, like there's always a difference. They're never the same. And I think we all have our reasons for that, but I think most of us are wrong about that reason. And, and I believe that the reason is when the firstborn were slain and the firstborn were saved that night in Egypt, God said that from now on I claim the firstborn as my own. Like he made that statement. He said the firstborn is his own. He said that the tribe of the Levites, that whole tribe, they represent the firstborn of all the other tribes. Like I'm taking them and I'm consecrating them to myself as my own. And he says that the, the first person who breaks the matrix of the mother's womb, that person is mine. And he was saying that that goes for animals as well. But he says, sanctify the firstborn to me. So when we talk sanctification, we're essentially talking about the deliverance process. We're talking about uprooting those things, mm -hmm. those curses, those spiritual entities in that firstborn because they're mine. I need you to, to take care of that spiritually. Okay? So when we, when we say that, what I tend to find is that my firstborn, Layla, she typically will manifest stuff and I'll notice stuff in her character more than I'll notice her struggle with things more than I'll notice little sister. And I believe it's because she's firstborn. She is the one that is the firstborn is just chosen to be sanctified. And I believe that these are the red flags or the signals that God will send us and show us through our firstborn to say, look, I need you to fix this. And so we'll just see a lot more stuff in her. And you might think your firstborn might be the struggle child, or you might think that right. the firstborn is a struggle because it's your first child, when the truth is is that they're just more of a priority when it comes to the things that he wants you to fix and correct. Because if you look biblically, the firstborn is the one who is in line to receive the most stuff. They're in line to receive the inheritance, the double portion of it. And if you think about it, that's why we're being sanctified every day. It's because we're being prepared to receive our inheritance because he does not want us to not be ready to manage that thing. Because he does not want us to move into our promised land and then stumble out of it or lose that inheritance to the devil. And so it's all about sanctification, but he's helping us deal with our own self in that process, but he wants this firstborn to not have to spend so much time in the wilderness. So he wants us to make them a priority. And so the things that I see Layla deal with, I realize that this is stuff that is in me. Right. Like I know that I have to take responsibility. Even if I think, oh, that's Cindy. Like I could see something that my child is dealing with. And I could be like, that ain't me. And I know y'all do that. Like, oh, that's your mama. And I can feel that way, but because of my respons because of my responsibility, and I understand that whether it's Cindy or not, I'm the one with the spiritual jurisdiction to say nah. Then I I go into the closet and I'm like, Lord, show me what is it, what is in me. And so I'll I'll give you an example. Just last week we were at a, a kitty party, and all of a sudden Layla starts kind of just freaking out about sitting at a group of sitting at a table with a group of kids that she doesn't know mm -hmm. and she's like having social anxiety like right in front of us we're just like yo what is going on 
And Luca's sitting there like happy to be at the party. Like, right. why's my sister? Why's my big sister tripping right now? Right. And the thing is that Layla was looking forward to this party. Like yeah. She helped me choose the gift. You know, she had been talking about it. Um, you know, it's a friend that she sees every so yeah. often. So she was very excited to attend this party. But the moment, you know, we stood in line to come in, it's like everything just flipped. Yeah, we saw our daughter tripping, and she was the only one at the party tripping like that. And people were looking at us like, yo, what's, is she good? Is she cool? Is right. she good? And I'm sitting there like, yo, she's actually having, like, fear, like, social anxiety right now. And I'm thinking, like, who is that from? Like, I'm immediately <laughs> like, who is that from? Because that ain't me. Like, first thing, I'm just like, that ain't me. Like, what is that? And so... I'm like, maybe it's not social anxiety. Maybe it's something else, and it just looks like that to us right now. You know, maybe she's dealing with something else. And and so, long story short is, I go pray about it that night, and I'm in my closet, and Holy Spirit is speaking, and he starts to show me that social anxiety is something that I had dealt with or hadn't dealt with. It's something that I had learned to cope with by avoiding crowds. And so if you know anything about me or my career, I would spend a lot of time going to like working professional sports as a chiropractor. And I would fly out to a city to work on a person. Let's say they're in, a, in the NFL and they have a football game. I might work on that person and... I will not go to the football game. And I'm talking my whole career. I don't know that I've ever, maybe once, I don't know that I've ever gone to an actual game. I would do my work at the hotel, and I would get on a flight and go home. And I would tell people, I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm not about to be, there's 80,000 people in there. I'm not even messing with that. I always felt like I would go in there, and as soon as there's a panic, my cell phone reception would probably go out. I just felt uncomfortable if I'm actually on the field and there's 80,000 people around me and surrounding me in this bowl-like structure. Like I had this anxiety about just, I don't go to games. It's just too many people. And I was never one to go to parties. And so I realized that it's not something that I understood that I had because I never had to manifest it because I avoided it. And so he kept showing me all these games all through my career that I have avoided. And he showed me actually cursing myself, saying, nah, I don't do those kind of crowds. Nah, I'm good. No thanks. I'm going home. And so I would treat the, the athlete, get my check, bounce, go home, not go to a single game. And he showed me that. And this, is, this could be 10, 15 years ago type stuff. But he showed me that, and he showed me that you do have this in your, your system, in your blood. You do have social anxiety. You just don't see it because it's not something you deal with. You don't see it because you don't put yourself in the position to have to deal with it. it you know, what's interesting is I heard you mention something at this party, at this event um, venue, I, I should say. You made mention like, oh, I can't believe I missed the hike for this. And it just kind of like, to me, I was like, Lord, why did you let me hear that? Hmm. Like, it just stood out to me. It's almost like you whispered it in my ear, but you you were kind of just talking to yourself. But I heard it and I was like, that doesn't sound peaceful. <laughs> you know, that sounds like he's It's not like I'd rather be somewhere in solitaire. Right. It sounds like I was basically saying, right. I'd rather be on a hike with just one or two people right. than all these people. Even though we saw around and we saw that this friend chose, uh, like they had to pay for us to be there. Yeah. Like he chose for us to celebrate with him, like on a special occasion for his child. Like we were honored yeah. to be invited, yeah. but yet because of the social anxiety, we were rejecting it. Yeah. But I, and like I said, even in the moment, I didn't see it that I was dealing with. The Holy Spirit had to reveal it to me, but I had to understand my spiritual jurisdiction to say like, yo, this had to come through me to hit my child. So I must take responsibility and Lord, I don't see it. I need you to show it to me. 
And so because I understood that principle, I asked and he revealed, had I not gone to him and taken responsibility, then I would have just kind of still been in the dark and, and that that curse would have flown under the radar and continued in my bloodline and, and that would have still not been dealt with. I would have thought that mm. she's tripping. Right. And so um, I handled that and it was something that I just had to handle within myself. I didn't have to grab her and cast out the demon of, you know, social anxiety or whatever. I, conf- I repented, I handled it and I took care of that thing. And when you do that, you shut the doors and you push them out of your house. And so what's interesting is that lots of other things happen like that. Whenever I see something pop up, I realize that, huh, before I jump on her, like, this must be me. And I just think that if we as parents take the time to self-assess first before we might jump on the child and even spank the child or punish the child or put them in time out or whatever you do to, to discipline, if we first take responsibility and we look at ourselves and we go pray and try to see what this is, he will give you the answer, but you first have to understand that this is my spiritual jurisdiction. This is my responsibility and show me this. And just to further vulnerabilize myself, there are different levels of, of things that you can partner with. And I just found also recently that my daughter Layla was also being very clingy to her mother, uh, being very, I don't know, she just she just had this sad mood. She wasn't joyous right. as she usually right. is. Like my child skips and somersaults and cartwheels Wherever all day she goes. <laughs> in the kitchen. <laughs> like if, if there's enough space, like she can actually stretch her arms out and see if there's enough space to do a cartwheel. Like she understands like how it works. She is skipping and somersaulting and round offs. Like in any if there's space for her body, she will do it. And it's just it's just how she moves. It's how she gets from A to B. This is because she's full of joy. My children are full of joy. And it's just the energy and the vibe of my house. And when that's missing, we see it. Right. It's and so, so obvious. It's been this vibe for maybe a couple of weeks. Yeah where it's just like something took her joy and it just seemed like everything would make her cry. She's whining and complaining about everything. And it it got to the point where like, I was just getting annoyed. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was just like, yo, what is this? Well, even for me, cause she was like right behind me. I'd be washing the dishes and she's standing right behind me. And I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, You know? And, and I do remember one night, like I just woke up in the middle of the night and I just heard the Lord say her joy um, is in trouble. Mm. Like I I saw that, you know, I saw that. It was clear enough for me to be like her joy is being jeopardized here. There's something there that's trying to jeopardize, trying to take hold of her joy, take, taking her joy hostage. Yeah. Um, what, but, I, what I saw was I couldn't put a finger on. Yeah. I wanted to know what spirit, yeah, what curse, what spirit was actually tormenting my child. And I saw her whining and complaining. I saw her crying whenever she didn't get her way. Like I just saw these, these things that were uh, just illegal in my house. And so I still couldn't put a finger on it. I just saw... In gratitude, obviously, if you're just wanting to complain about everything. I also was like, yo, is this witchcraft? Like, I feel like she's being manipulative because she's crying whenever she doesn't get what she wants. And so I saw so much stuff, but I couldn't put a finger on it. And so I just had to pray about it. And and I actually stopped her and I said, yo, like, what are you hearing? Like, who's talking to you? Like, you, you, this is not you. Like, I looked her in the eye and I said this. And she understood where I was going with this. Like, my kids, they know deliverance, so they understand that daddy's digging for something. And so I put my hand on her and I prayed and I asked the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, I need you to reveal what it is 
that's speaking to my child. I'm willing to take full responsibility for what this is. I'm willing to repent, but I'm struggling to know what this is, and I need your help. So I laid my hand on her, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. What spirit is this? Because I understand that even though I saw all these manifestations in these things, I still didn't know what spirit it was. If it were you, I can see, oh, that's anxiety, because you might manifest anxiety in the way that might be more textbook. But a child is not manifesting our spirits the same exact way. Right. And so we might not recognize the stuff that we have in them because they're going to manifest it differently. And to add, Layla manifests with illness often. Mm -hmm. She's not sick often. So when it does, when we do notice that something happened, like right after this birthday party, like on the way home, she she had the sniffles and I thought it was just from crying. Yeah. But from then on, yeah. you know, she had a cold. She, you know, she had a cough. She ended up having a fever. Yeah. Like she manifests with illness. She 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 worked. I knew that she had worked herself into that. I knew it. I knew that because she didn't have any sweets and she didn't eat the cake. No. So I knew that it wasn't because she had a bunch of candy. I knew that this sadness, this what she was dealing with had allowed her to work herself into low energy. She was kind of developing fever, but it wasn't really a sickness. And I did not acknowledge that. No, she I didn't just throw felt, up. She didn't nothing. Yeah, she wasn't sick, no. but I knew that she worked herself up. And so I was clueless as to what I knew it was a spirit. And I knew that it was something that was sliding under my radar because of how it manifests in a child. And so when that happens, I stopped, I prayed, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, identify yourself. And I said, baby girl, just tell me the name you just that comes across your mind right now. Tell me what you hear. When you said identify yourself, can we just clarify who you were speaking to? So I asked Holy Spirit to expose the spirit that was tormenting my child. And so when I look at, the, when I look at you in your eyes... I'm looking into the window of your soul. That's the dimension that these spirits play. That's where they live. And so I looked her in her eye, and she knew that I was speaking to the spiritual entity that was causing her to go through all these feelings. And so I said, identify yourself. And so I fully expected that that spirit would say his name. And I, I didn't expect for her to know what anxiety was. And I didn't know that it was going to be that. But she looked at me, and she immediately said, anxiety. And I was like, whoa. Never heard my daughter use that word right, ever. Right. She doesn't know what it is. So I know that Holy Spirit exposed. I don't know if that spirit spoke to my daughter or if Holy Spirit spoke to her. But I just asked her, I said, just tell me the name, the word that comes across your mind right now. And she said anxiety, and she said it with confidence. And so I know that the Holy Spirit was helping me out in that moment. And so I took that moment as a moment of grace. And I realized that the Lord was showing me what I needed to handle. And so what I asked him was, I knew that this was something I needed to repent of. So I need you to show me what I got anxiety over. And so what he showed me was, it wasn't anxiety like, I'm super like nervous or like I have fear or like I'm tripping, you know, like heart racing and just the textbook anxiety. He was showing me that I'm, I've been anxious about some things. Like there's some things and sometimes your anxiety can just be excitement. But he was showing me that I'm kind of in this transition where I'm, I've, I've, I've retired and kind of laid down the whole doctor thing, the whole, you know, just the last 20 something years of my life. And I know that God has something next for me. And I'm kind of transitioning into that right now. And I know that it's upon us. I know that that thing that I'm supposed to transitioning to, I, I believe it's this year. I believe it's months away. 
like I believe is so close. And so like even just how I'm saying it, you can sense like there's some anxiety around that. Like there is like every night I'm like, Lord, what is it? What is it? What is it? Tell me, tell me. You know, and he's just like, you know, my timing is perfect. But I'm I'm pressing him every night, like, what is it? What do you want me to do? I'll do anything, Lord. Uh, and, he, and he showed me that. He showed me, like, every night you got my feet, like, sweating me about tomorrow. You know, and the word says, like, tomorrow has enough to worry about. So he gives you a daily bread. Focus about today. Yeah. And so he's showing me that was my anxiety. I was anxious about tomorrow. And I had kept, I keep living in that. Even if I think tomorrow is months down the line. I'm just like, Lord, what is it? At least tell me what it is. Like, just let me know something. And I've been doing that for some time now. And I realized that he was, he in that moment was showing me that to show me that I had partnered with anxiety. And so in that moment I broke because I realized that my daughter had been suffering because of my excitement for the future or my struggle to just let God have it and just rest, you know? And, and so I was convicted. I wept and with my daughter right there in my arms and I repented and I prayed and asked for forgiveness. And what was interesting is I know that it left me the atmosphere changed. I, I manifested. Like, I, I just wept and, and I felt it leave me. And she started crying again. Usually she'll cry. You know, that's how kids will manifest or a lot of people manifest when the demon is leaving them. But she said, like, I'm still sad. Like, she was saying, like, it's still there. And I was confident that I did what I needed to do. And so I asked. I looked her in the eye and I said, are you still there? Yes or no? And she looked at me and said, yes. Now, I know someone watching is saying, why are you talking to spirits? Or spirits don't talk to you. Or go read your Bible. Like, I don't have time to tell you like 10 different instances, you know, where where the spirits are speaking. Or where Jesus is speaking to a spirit. But go read your Bible. Um, but she, the, the, the spirit was still there. And so I asked, typically my first thing I ask is, do you have a permit? Because that's if they're still there, there's, there's a reason they're still there. And so Holy Spirit revealed to me that, that my wife was the permit. And so you were on your way out. I believe, and I called you into the room, and I just asked her, I looked her in the eye, and I said, is my wife the permit? And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at my wife, and I let her know what I had just confessed or repented of, and and I told her my role and, and what had happened and what my daughter had been dealing with, but Basically, I needed for her to admit that she herself had also been dealing with Mm -hmm. a similar situation. And so you began to admit to me that, yes, like, I feel you. Like, I've been struggling with that, too. I've been wondering what's next, and I've been sweating him about this. And and so she came into agreement and was like, yeah, it's me, too. Mm -hmm. And so then she began... She got on her knees and began to pray, and she began to weep and to repent. And I felt, as it was leaving her, I could feel it Mm -hmm. because I am the door to my house. And so I was able to feel the thing that was happening to her spiritually. And so as it left, I could feel, I had my hand on my daughter's stomach, and it was almost like she was gassy but I felt something leave her. And we went on a hike after that. Right. How and was she's it? been good, like, <laughs> ever since that moment right. that you repented. It was like, oh, so this does mean that the mother does have a lot to say. And so if the mother is not in agreement, 
then that child can still be suffering. And so that's why it's important that even though the father has like the top dog spiritual jurisdiction, if the wife is not in agreement or if she's not in submission, right. then the children is gonna, the children are going to suffer. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say too much, but just just some more biblical. If you think about Joseph in his dream, he dreamed about the the moon and the stars, the sun, moon, and the stars bowing down to him. His father immediately knew what he was talking about. He was like, you think your mother and me right. are going right. to? That's because the sun and the moon represent the government. If you go into Genesis, it talks about the sun and moon governing the day and the night. But the sun and the moon symbolically represent the government. And the parents in that, that dream represented the sun and the moon, or the sun and moon represented the parents. And so parents represent government. And so in general, when the government is is at peace and at rest and, and everything is moving smoothly, like the people are happy, the people are fat, they're good. But when the government is corrupt and, 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 and there's unrest and, and chaos, it shows in the people. So we're kind of like a principality over our home. Absolutely. That's not kind of like, that's what it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. We are the sun and the moon. We are the governing, we are the government. And the people are a reflection of the government. Yeah. That's Bible. And so it was, we are the sun and the moon. It's not just the sun, but the sun is the omega. You know what I'm saying? Like the moon is reflecting from the sun. But you had to be able to come into agreement so that we can help our child. Right. If you and I were having beef and we weren't able to communicate, I would have cried my eyes out and, and repented all I could day and night. But because you were under the same thing, that spirit had a permit. So you, were, you did have enough jurisdiction to be able to to allow that spirit to stay in spite of my efforts. And so we do have to be in agreement. It's not just me as the father. And I think we've seen that before where you and I were, were at odds with each other. Yeah. And I shared my feelings out loud and she was within reach and she started getting sick. Literally that moment started getting sick, like, fever throwing up and soon enough I mean later that evening um I went into my prayer closet because I, I could feel like this this weight on me of like what's happening right now like this is I don't have time to be even dealing with this with you know uh, being at odds with my husband um my daughter being sick like I believe we were packing to move here so it's like we had we had things to be done like there was a deadline and so I just felt like I needed to go into my prayer room and like immediately, like I was in tears because he just started showing that there was a heaviness that I was carrying um, from childhood, like pretty much not knowing how to ask for help and being upset at someone because they didn't help me. And he just started showing me and he just started leading me through repentance and, you know, he forgave me and showing that I had to ask you for forgiveness, you know, for how I leashed out at you. But I remember before I did that, I, after I finished praying, I went into the room, you were putting the girls to bed and she had already fallen asleep because she wasn't feeling well. And you might have probably fallen asleep too. And so I remember just putting my hand on her, on her and she was already asleep, but I just started confessing everything that he had showed me and, and that, um, I had repented and he had forgiven me. And as I, as I was sharing this, I could feel her fever going down. And by the end of, of my conversation with the sleeping child, like it was gone. And I think you woke up a little bit after and you, you recognized that you recognized that she was no longer sick. Um, and you received it. You received that I had repented and that, I, you know, like, I was no longer at odds with you. What's interesting is that that that's not the first time that obviously we have a husband and wife beef or, or whatever in the house. But what's interesting is that you said that, oh, she was in earshot. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I've seen it to where we had a closet beef, you know, just me and you, a disagreement on something, and it was unresolved. And so there was just, it just set a vibe in the house that there was an unresolved issue. And I've seen the same thing happen to her. Right. So the child doesn't need to hear or have any idea what's going on. You can think, oh, we don't fight in public or we don't argue in front of the children. There was the spirit of strife. Mm-hmm. The spirit of strife was was between us. There was a spirit of division in my home at the time. Mm-hmm. And my child received that spirit into her. And the spirit of division might be you and I being at odds with one another and arguing. But in a child who doesn't have the vernacular or the the vocabulary to express that or even know what that means, they're going to manifest it in a different way. Right. Typically with a child at that age, too, that was two years ago, three years ago maybe, she might be five or, or, or four, her vocabulary to manifest certain things, it's just going to have to come physically. And so typically we're talking fever. You're right. We're talking low energy. We're talking just fatigue. Like the child is sick because of the spiritual energy in the house. You don't have to believe that. But if you find your child mysteriously suffering from some kind of fever and you don't know why she's sick or her tummy aches, Mm. I'm just challenging you to check the vibe, check the, check the temperature in the room. Make sure that I believe if, if you have a, a joy vibe in your home and you and your husband are like, bam, like getting it, uh, getting along and everything is great. And you guys are like making love every night, like boom, your child ain't going to be sick. And so just take some responsibility. If, if, if you notice that your child is under the weather, noticeably, when you know that you and your spouse are not clicking, I'm telling you, if you make amends and you fix that thing, your child will get better a lot faster. I'm telling you, if, if your child gets sick, check the vibe. I'm telling you. And it's, it's interesting because there's kids that get sick a lot it's because their parents are at odds a lot. And oftentimes our parents aren't even together. Imagine right. that child. Right. But strife and division in the home typically will manifest as physical illness in a child. And so that's a whole other topic right. or podcast. Like I can go on a whole list of how a child will manifest something differently than how it might manifest in the adult. And so we've just kind of given you an example from our personal life with how a child might deal with anxiety, how a child might deal with strife and division in the home. Like these are examples to say that just because you don't recognize what's going on or where it came from, you have to to ask Holy Spirit to interpret that language to you so that you can know because you should know that it's coming from you. You just need to identify it and translate it in your language because how whatever spirit that has access through you, it's just going to manifest in your child at his grade level. And so for you to be able to recognize that, it's going to take a high level of discernment. And so you're going to have to find intimacy with Holy Spirit and ask to reveal that thing to you so that you can take your spiritual jurisdiction and do what you need to do to take care of it on your end. Because until you take care of it on your end, it's going to just keep showing up in them. If you've allowed it in the home, then it has permit. It has a legal license to be there. You can yell at your child. You can discipline them all you want. You can send them to camps. You can send them into counseling. It does not matter. You are the spiritual doers. You are this, the top dog police officer of your home. And if you've allowed it and it's come in and you don't even realize you've allowed it or you just don't appreciate the jurisdiction that you have, 
it's going to be a problem that's not going to be solved. You're dealing with a spiritual problem. And until you take responsibility for that thing, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's, it's going to be a problem. And you're going to throw a lot of money and time and energy at it. And you'll probably just kind of give up and just tag the child a problem child. Right. And not take responsibility and understand that it's something in you. It is. And until you take responsibility and ask the Lord to show you what it is, because what you're seeing, you're not seeing it in yourself because of how they're manifesting. You need to ask the Lord to show you what the Craig version of that thing is, what the Cindy version of what you're seeing is, because it's it's there. It's just a different expression. And because as you get older, whining and complaining and, and a child might be whining and complaining, but because you've gotten older, you know that that's annoying and people don't want to mess with that. Right. And so maybe <laughs> in you, you struggle with passive aggressiveness. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe you communicate in a manner that uh, you subtweet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you have a different way of communicating, but it's still it's still whining and complaining. But as an adult, you've you've learned how to shift that thing and and just like I myself didn't see myself with social anxiety, but it's because I don't put myself in the situation to manifest that. I don't put myself in situations to have social anxiety. So in my mind, I don't struggle with that because mm-hmm. it's not a struggle if I never put myself in crowd. You're doing the same thing. And so, hmm. Yeah, this is heavy stuff, y'all. This is heavy stuff. And if you're not willing to understand, like, you have to take responsibility and that you do absolutely have the spiritual jurisdiction and responsibility to make sure that whatever you allow to access you, you understand that your child is is connected to you. That is your bloodline. And so that spiritual entity has access to your child and you allow it. And it's so serious because not only is it deceiving you and leading you astray, but it's tormenting your child. Yeah. Like these are our kids. Like I really heard when it says your your daughter's joy is being taken hostage. Like her joy, like her joy is everything from sunrise to sunset. Joy, yeah. It's and it was just stealing it. Yeah. Like it was just, and, and I could see it as fear. I could see it as so much. And it was tormenting her. Even at that party, I was like, it's a lie. I said, it's a lie. And I shut it up. You know, I was like, I shut up every lie that's telling her that she doesn't want to be here. But it was tormenting her. And And we can speak to that thing. But like. But until it, we speak to I didn't it in know us. what it right, right. Yeah, until we've identified right. it in us. Like but, you can speak to that thing, you can yell at them, you can discipline all you want to. Um, you know, I have to and 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 just like I I take responsibility for the social anxiety, I also understand that because she's first born and she belongs to the Lord, just she's first born. And so it is our job to set her apart. I also realized that Holy Spirit can use her to communicate, to be my mirror, mm-hmm. to Very show me so. what I need to deal with in, in myself. So he's also showing me how to self-heal. He's showing me what I need to handle so that I can be ready and prepared for my next. He's, he needs to take these things away from me. He's telling me that your promised land cannot, you can't have this there. And so I also look at it as she's kind of the the sacrifice. Mm. Like she has to suffer with these things and manifest these emotions so that I can know what I need help with. Mm. And I believe that I'm just in that period where, yeah, I see these things because I'm I'm in that word, and that word is is that deep that it's 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 two edge. And it's 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 dividing between soul and spirit, and it's finding the things, it's showing me the yeah. things that I need to fix. <laughs> but also, there are other ways that He shows us. 
it's just an avenue in which the father can expose some things for your benefit. And if you're not in your word, then he's going to show you in other ways. He's going to show you in dreams. He's going to show you in your child's behavior and your child is just going to become a magnified mirror. And so he, it's a priority. It's very important that you see the stuff he's trying to show you. And if we're not in intimacy with him, if we're not in our word, if we're not getting that surgery done in our closet, in our prayer time, there are just other things that are going to pop up in our face to reveal these things. And if we don't even catch the cue there, then what do you do? You know, like, what do you do if he's sending you all the signals to help you? You know, it makes me think of that story you would hear growing up in different sermons about you would hear the story of the man that was stranded, you know, I guess on a raft in the middle of the ocean and the helicopter came and he's like, no, I'm waiting for the Lord or the, the person on the boat came. He's like, no, I'm waiting on the Lord. And you know, all these different things came and I guess he died and went to heaven or whatever. And he was like, yo, what happened? And the Lord's like, yo, I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter. I sent like, that's what I see. I see there's so many ways that he tries to help us. There's so many ways that he tries to show us how to cleanse our bloodline. He tries to show us, how to repent, how to sanctify ourselves, how to make sure that the devil has no hold on us and no power in us or nothing in common with us. And he just has different options. But if, if one of those options, you're not in your word, you're not spending time with him, life is going to be how he shows you. And it might not even be your child. It could be yourself. It could just be you might manifest sickness you might find yourself manifesting stuff. And and if you don't catch it, then you're just going to keep knocking your head against the wall. And I guess I'm here to tell you that you're missing it because of either your ignorance to spiritual warfare or things of the spirit or deliverance in general or your resistance to it or your ignorance to curses. You're missing it. And so you're missing the helicopter and, and the boat and all the things that are coming to you because you just think, oh, when I was saved, God took care of all of that. Or when I was saved, you know, all that stuff is Old Testament, you know, and you're just kind of just choosing ignorance. Well, I mean, that thought, that mentality and really that theology takes away from our need of intimacy with him. And that's really yeah. what we're saying. It's yeah. like, we don't need all that because he already gave it to me. Where it's yeah. just like, you know, an inheritance usually isn't even given to you all at once. Hmm. You know, it comes in bits and pieces. And if you want to share, you know, the story of your journey, like, how you came to learn all of this, it was through intimacy and it was through word. It was through your prayer closet where you would come out with a new revelation, you know, with wisdom of how to apply this. This is how you've learned all of this. Yeah. I think that the people who, who just want to just claim their salvation and kind of walk away with the free ticket in the heaven and just do what they want to do and, li and just live life until Jesus comes. I feel like those are just the people who are not just hungry for deep intimacy with the father. Mm -hmm. Like they're not seeking that because if they were in that place, this is the stuff that he'd be laying out to them. Yeah. Like he'd be exposing them. He'd be exposing darkness. He'd be encouraging them to subdue darkness He'd be taking them through the process of sanctification. Like that is what intimacy does. And so if you are that person who's just like, oh, I don't need to do that or I don't need that, then where where are you when it comes to intimacy with him? Right. Like really, like really, how close are you to him if you're not at his feet and you're not allowing him to take that scalpel 
and go deep and be honest with him like you don't have to be honest with us yeah like you know we put on a facade of religion of i do this i do that but it's just like if he were to step into the room and show you your cards he would show you the truth like be honest with those with those things with those truths like, yeah it doesn't matter what other people see what other people think really take us out of the picture you and him you're in the closet like you that's what him. we do we're that's in the closet it is. Close like, the door. It's, it's a personal relationship it's intimate but if you are just totally avoiding intimacy like do you really know him like i, I don't think you know him i don't think you know him i think you know of him i think yeah. you know church i think you know religion i don't think you really have a relationship with jesus i don't i don't think you know him like you think you do I don't think you know your word like you think you do. Well, there's so much more. You could go your whole life in deep intimacy with him in the closet, and there's still so much more of him to be revealed. So yeah. we can't stop with what we learned as children or youth or even, f you know, 30 years at church. Yeah, yeah. And you can't he, be satisfied with that. And you think you have to be a fanatic to really want to dive deep when the truth is, is that this is what he's calling us to do. Like, he desires this. He desires intimacy. He desires a personal relationship. This is why he wanted to domicile himself within us. This is why he wanted us to be a tent, to carry his spirit. This is, this is intimacy. Salvation is so much more than going to heaven. And I think that that's how we grow up, is believing that I just need to believe and I'm saved, and I just go about my life. But we don't take responsibility, and we don't really have our eyes open to spirituality. I know I did. I know I was in the dark for a long time. And so you could see how it used to be. You know, a lot of people would kind of like um, label us as fanatic, but the thing is we've been there. So we know you've never been here. Those people that, you know, yeah. say you guys are too much or you've yeah. never been here. But the thing is, I've been there. Yeah. So I could tell you the difference. Yeah. The difference is that I would see myself as a fanatic, too, if I was back where you are. Yeah. And, and, and so because I've been there, I know that this is forward. This is. I'm, I'm here now. And so I can see in retrospect that it's not that I'm the fanatic or I'm in the fanatical zone. It's that I'm no longer sleep. I'm alive in the spirit. I am not spiritually blind. And I can tell you that I was once spiritually blind. We're dead and in I our can, sin and our fences. Yeah, I can look at someone and I can see you. I've been there. I can identify. However, you cannot identify with me because you are still blind. And because you cannot not identify, you can just label me now. You can look and say, oh, he's fanatic or oh, he's too deep off into that spiritual stuff. Or you can you can say, you know, he's into the demonic stuff, you know. But the truth is, is that because you lack understanding, it's all you can do is label. But because I do understand where you are. I know where you need to be and I can tell you that you're in a place of blindness and your eyes need to be opened. And until that happens, this is just going to seem like some far out crazy stuff. And you're going to just basically stay where you are. Your children are going to continue to suffer. Yeah. And I'm telling you, like if, if it was just for their sake, yeah. like do this for their sake. Yeah. Like it, it really bothers me to know that, the things that I'm not getting, whether it be through the word or I'm just not seeing or I'm in, I'm in denial, but the things I'm not getting, like my daughter's having to suffer. Right. So She's imagine suffering. if we didn't have relationship with God and we didn't know we could ask Holy Spirit and that we could hear his voice. Like if we weren't here or if we weren't in this in this place of faith, like. What she would just our continue life to be suffer like? with anxiety. She's continued to have social anxiety. She continued to struggle with anxiety and crying and whining and, you know, having fevers and just we just be thinking she's a sickly That's child. That's just who and, she is. Yeah. And and then we just 
think that that's her plot in life. And the truth is, is that that's what it will become. And the thing is, like, I, I could see if this is a place we stayed in, because like you had mentioned before, like after Layla had been in this place of now we understand was anxiety, like it was starting to affect our responses to her, our reaction to her. Like we were starting to get annoyed by it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, there was points where I was like, Layla, like give me some space. And so I could imagine how without this revelation that God just, you know, unveiled before us, that would create such a distance between us, between now and her teenage years. And when people oh, say, yeah. oh, teenage years are so horrible, you know, like, I'm not saying they can't be tough, but how much of that was because you never stepped in? How much of that was because you were just either ignorant or oblivious or not humble enough to say, this is me? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And and to think that she will go on and and become an adult and pass this along to her children. You know, and, and that's where we get the generational cycle thing. I think that, you know, my struggle in seeing my child suffer and struggle with something that is in me is, is, is hard because I can imagine that I'm suffering from something and not even realizing it. Like I'm, I have social anxiety or, or and I did have social anxiety, but I wasn't struggling with it. <laughs> Because I wasn't in the setting. I didn't put myself in that position. Right. Whereas my child is suffering with something that is in me that I'm dealing with. You know? And so she is pretty much because I'm watching her be a victim yeah. of my sin. Wow. Of my Jesus. sin. And I can easily find ways to punish her for my sin. Right. We do. I could punish my child for my mm-hmm. sin. And so I have to be very mindful and careful with my approach. And, you know, the only time, like, I, I, I really consider discipline is in the moment where the Holy Spirit is just like, you need to handle that now. Outside of that, I'm just like, geez, I got to go in my closet. I got to figure out what this is. What is this? What is going on? You know, what am I not seeing? What am I missing? And if you're not willing to put yourself in, in that position, uh, you're you're going to miss it. And you're going to sentence your child to a, to have to figure this out on their own, maybe when they're in their 40s. Hopefully. If they do. Or they're just, like I said, pass it on to their children. And that's typically what happens with the generational curses. If they just keeps passing on, you know. But, yeah, it's it's... It's very sobering to to realize that if I see something under my roof, it's very likely that it's something in me that is manifesting. And it's something that I need to take responsibility for as the father, as the priest of my home. And I got to figure that thing out. And I, I feel like I need to figure it out fast. Because right. it's it's an emergency to me. Right. My child is suffering. Right. Like she's being tormented by demons. There's something tormenting her. My child that is full of joy is is sad. And that's what she told me. She was like, I feel sad. She's sad, the opposite of joy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like this is not her. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, that's 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 another level of accountability. And responsibility is when you see I need to self-assess if I see my daughter struggling with something that is beneath her or beneath kingdom. But it's an emergency to me. Like I need I need to know and, and I'm on my face and I'm crying out to know what it is, even if it's just for making sure that she's not suffering anymore with it. She's a child. And she came into this world born in sin and shaping in iniquity. She came into this world with our stuff. And so it's my job to cleanse my bloodline. It's my job to 
make sure that the things that they're dealing with because of me, that might be because of my father or his father or his father, I make sure that they don't have to struggle with that. I believe that is my responsibility. And so as I go through my own process of sanctification, I might believe that I'm doing that because it's my goal in life to become more like Jesus or it's what I'm called to do. But my motivation is on a whole nother level when I have children and I believe that they could at any moment just start manifesting and suffering and being tormented by whatever spirit has access to me. Like it could just get triggered at any moment. It could just be tomorrow. It could be a whole nother situation and I can learn of some other thing that, that I'm dealing with that I didn't even know I was dealing with. But that's the level of responsibility that you have as a parent. And it's so much deeper than paying the bills and, and, putting food on the table Mm -hmm. and clothes on their back. And a lot of us as parents really think we are on it when we do those things. Right. And then we get confused when a few years later, our child is, you know, bitter and resentful toward us. Hmm. The firstborn is they're, they're the sacrificial lamb, you know, and I have to, I understand, you know, why they deserve, the double portion of the inheritance and the blessing and why they're so important in the kingdom. You know, I see like they carry way more. I see her suffering sometime and I see her sister just watching. Like, <laughs> right. Like with popcorn. Right. Like legit, like, like what's going on? Right. Like, this is crazy. Even though her sister, she's a seer. She could see sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I'll ask her. Like, yeah. Hey, do you see? She's not struggling and suffering like her no, sister. Man. Not She's all. not tormented like her sister. But like I said, if your child is tormented in any way, it's because you have yes. allowed access into the home. Yeah. They don't have a choice to just bring what they want into the home. 